and welcome to the 10th episode of Film Revision. About six weeks ago, the outstanding uh, industry magazine, Entertainment Weekly, uh, made a list of what they called uh, the top new classics uh, in film, TV, music, etc. Um, it seems that they were not so much compiling a list of the best films or whatever of, of the last 25 years, but instead, uh, it seemed to me that they were, uh, the list was more about the works that have most infiltrated the collective public consciousness over the last 25 years. Only one of the films uh, on their list was from 1983, and it is our film for discussion today. Um, listing, it, listing it at number 48, uh, they called Brian De Palma's Scarface the godfather for the hip-hop generation, a claim that I might want to investigate today. Um, our guests for this investigation are the gorgeous and intrepid <laughs> Rachel Parker um, from uh, the West Village area of Manhattan, and the owner of the casual game company Rebel Monkey, Nick Fortunio, uh, who lives in the Upper West Side. Thanks, guys, for coming. Your first impressions of Scarface. You can see how it's like affected culture in such a deep, deep way. <laughs> what was interesting is that I thought there was all this neat potential for these themes that were being explored, and but the movie itself was sort of a mess. Like, like it kind of it hit some points and missed some points and it was complicated in certain places and really simple and didactic in others, so it was an interesting mess. Rachel. I'm, I'm pretty simple when it comes to this film and I think it's because there just wasn't a lot of feminine energy in the film. Uh, there was a lot of acting going on. I didn't like any of the characters. F. Murray Hamer, Abraham. Yeah, I liked him. Great. He's a great amazing. actor. I mean, he's, this is one year before Amadeus, which to me is one of the greatest performances of all time. He had the most dimensions of anyone else uh, in the film. I agree that the uh, the Michelle Pfeiffer role was was um, was weak, but I you know I admire her a lot for because I feel like she brought something extra to the table because you can the words Absolutely. were nothing, and it, there was something going on for her underneath there for a young model turned actress. Right. She was starting to get it. Absolutely. And she also was one of the few to have like a bit of an arc. Right. Yes. And she gets away. Mm -hmm. That's right. She doesn't die mm -hmm. in that rainstorm of well, bullets. Operatic. That's All a right. nice word for it. Well, I mean, but that's where it comes from. I think, I think the roots of the film in both style and plot come from the sort of like melodramatic Italian opera thing. You know, with De Palma's, you know, huge pullback, slow pullback shots. You know, I could, you, know, you could just hear like an aria, but instead he's got Giorgio Moroder's, you know, very electronic score going on yeah. instead. And, and, but I mean, like, I feel like the grandiosity, and it may not be a word, I don't care. I love <laughs> I'll that I'll give it word. to you. Okay, you. thank you. Um, the grandiosity of it uh, matched the tone and style of those, those operas that uh, some of, the, some of uh, his contemporaries seem to connect with. But I think that's an interesting point about the opera because like the scene I liked most, I think in the whole movie, the riot in the, in the Freedom Town, they're chanting, right? Mm -hmm. And that moment when they're chanting and everybody's chanting, which is the sort of masking for the, the stab. For the murder, yes. Like that's really, really powerful. It's very cinematic. And it, it has a kind of, I feel like that, 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 that the sound in that scene gives it a kind of power that I think the, the operatic leaning of the rest of the movie doesn't really have. Michelle Pfeiffer has a line in this movie. This line, is, I think, is supposed to sum up the movie, but I also think it sums up the style, and that is, she says, nothing exceeds oh, like yes. excess. Mm -hmm. It's not only like, this is the point of the movie, guys, but also, <clears throat> that to me, it's the problem with the style of the movie. Like, there's so many times when he chooses style over substance, and I, I just think of the, mo uh, the moments when uh, Al Pacino is like in a, doing a drug deal on one side of the street, and he will come out the window all the way across the street, all the way, still go we're still going across the street, still going, <laughs> and then we land on Stephen Bauer in the car, and then we go all the oh, way yeah, back. There's nice. all this negative space, and, and time is so precious. Right. Um, and, it's, and an arm and a leg are being cut off. And all the time that it took us to go back and forth, it hadn't been cut off yet. <laughs> I mean, gotta get to it. I'm trying to determine if he was being excessive on purpose because that was like the point of the movie. So I was thinking about movies like The Godfather and like the pacing of a movie like The Godfather that it's Godfather like, is like it's, is so much better. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it never has that. I mean, like, and every time Godfather does something stylistic, it's always, and that's the genius of it. It's always motivated by yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's what I felt with like an absence of motivation. And maybe that's the point, right? Because it's like an absence of motivation. Like it didn't feel tight enough for that to work, which I which is a criticism I had of the whole movie. I mean there's that scene with Michelle Pfeiffer in the in, in the car and the car she didn't like and he gets in and he puts on her hat like trying to be joking. And that's the moment she 
breaks. Right here. <laughs> <laughs> so um, far. Yeah, it's still but I mean, like, too. he does the old vertigo dolly in and zoom out. Why? What oh, in that scene? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What in that scene needs that special? Why this scene? That this seems a throwaway scene. Very odd. I agree. So it seems like we feel similarly uh, negative about this about this movie. Am yeah, I misquoting? Yeah. Am I misrepresenting? No, no, no. no, no. no. Nope. no similarly just, negative. Go. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Explain to me the legacy. It, it's got this like myth making that's become so popular. In, in hip hop music about like rising up from nothing and becoming really, really powerful. And, and then, it's got the bling too. Yeah, and bling, totally blinged out. Isn't he the underdog? Isn't he the guy that comes up? The minority you know, underdog. Yeah, just, yeah, and totally comes up and makes something of himself. And you know, if that means that you die at an early age with guns ablazing, so be it. You've got your is he a hero? I, mean, do you, do you feel I like think he that maybe in the hip hop world he is considered well, a hero. But even maybe. in a general sense, maybe. right? I mean, like, what, he's what's, a bastard from the beginning. Yeah, but what? Where? Where yeah. is he a bastard? Right? He's like, I mean, I, I don't know. I'm well, just come sort of on, he through. doesn't kill uh, mothers and children. children right? So, he wants to get married. You know. He wants to have kids. He's like, like Manny will. This sneak approach around. to getting married is highly suspect. Yeah, but like, he, doesn't, he doesn't walk up to women and do the tongue thing, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah, that's true. Oh my god. This character, he's a bad guy, but he's got a code of honor. He's tough. He's not that code of honor is thin. Oh, though. totally, totally. <laughs> but it's, it's, you know, he doesn't kill the, the women and children. I don't think that code of honor of not killing women and children was established before that moment. Yeah, I Absolutely. totally agree. It was so the moment it felt it was false, like, oh, and, by and the I way, kind of wanted the woman and child to die because it seemed more in keeping with what has been set up. Yeah. Oh, it totally. But how many work. innocent people die during the movie? Like, how many like truly innocent people? How many in truly innocent people do we see? True. Oh. True. Right, I guess, but I, well, well G it. Gina dies, right? <laughs> she dies. She Gina gets to dies. be the innocent victim that, that, that drives us Okay, down. she was firing a gun at him at the time that she was killed. She killed That's, her husband, right? Yeah. Uh, well, this is just another issue, which is another opera thing. Like, it was an yeah. opera yeah. slash Shakespearean, that whole totally. idea of the secret marriage. Dude, why are you going to surprise him with the marriage? What a <laughs> dumb <laughs> idea that was. Because he's really good with surprise. Oh, yeah, exactly. Oh, my God. You run away to a house that you don't tell Tony you're going to, and then you that's answer the right. door when he's looking for your sister. Right, and then she comes out in a bathrobe. That's that's a complete Shakespeare Good, okay. contrivance, though. I mean, think about it. I mean, like yeah. it's the whole Romeo and Juliet. Like they took poison at the different times. I mean, it's that same idea. And that's where I. That's one another time where I'm thinking. I was thinking, you know, this sort of opera opera thing. Yeah. Um, so all right, closing thoughts. I'll never have to see this movie again. But um, I'm glad that I did revisit it. So I want to thank you for I'm that. On film revision. See I'm how she did that? <laughs> very nice. Thank you. I'm glad I saw it because it's clearly a myth that's like so pervasive now. I think it's a film of missed opportunity. There's all of this stuff about communism and the coming to, ca to, to, to capitalism. Yeah, and it was yeah. all there. And it doesn't ever gel. And really. what's sad about that is they took so much time. Like, if you're going to have three hours, use it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, I'm frustrated. All right, it's time to close out another edition of Film Revision. Um, on Real 13, uh, this Saturday, August 16th, uh, we have a significantly better filmmaker in Alfred Hitchcock with uh, his classic adaptation of the play, Dial M for Murder. Um, the Real 13 short, which will be... Uh, comes after the classic that you will have chosen on uh, real13.org. Um, and The Evening of Cinema closes out with uh, David Gordon Green having his uh, another film appear on Real 13, Undertow, starring Jamie Bell as a young teen on the run from his evil uncle, Josh Lucas. You can find stills, trailers, synopses, discussions for all these Real 13 films on the Real 13 Facebook page. Um, so you should check it out, become a fan. I think you'll enjoy it. In the meantime, Film Revision will be back in about a week or so where we're going to talk about the film Cross Creek, which is a little-known film about uh, the author Marjorie Kinnon Rawlings, who wrote uh, the famous kids' book, The Yearling. So it should be an interesting discussion. I uh, hope you check it out. Thanks very much. We'll talk to you soon.